Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 108. Every great idea is on the verge of being stupid. Michelle Gondry. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Videoblocks. Now, Videoblocks is a subscription-based stock media company that gives you unlimited access to premium stock footage everyone could afford. If you're looking for like extra exterior shots or things that you might want to incorporate into any of your projects, whether it be a narrative, documentary, music videos, commercials, these guys got you covered. They've got unlimited daily downloads from a library of over 115,000 HD video clips, as well as a huge selection of After Effects templates for like opening credits, uh, motion graphics titles, company logos, as well as motion backgrounds as well. It's pretty amazing. And on average, uh, subscribers pay less than a dollar per download in the course of a year. And the content does not get stale. They're constantly adding new content to the library every month. So it keeps it keeps it very, very fresh and you always have something new to look forward to. And everything you download is 100% royalty free. Even if your subscription is canceled, you have unrestricted usage rights for anything you want to do, including personal projects and commercial projects. And you keep whatever you download and maintain the usage rights forever. Now, Video Blocks is offering the Tribe a yearly subscription for ninety-nine bucks. That's fifty bucks off the usual price tag, just for you guys, just for the Tribe. That's less than ten bucks a month. So to get this deal, just head over to VideoBlocks.com/hustle. That's VideoBlocks, V-I-D-E-O Blocks.com forward slash hustle for this exclusive offer. And don't forget to go to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobooks from Audible. So guys, man, I wanted to give you an update on the release of the trailer of This Is Meg. Uh, We've been downloaded and viewed over almost 15,000 times in the day and a half. Uh, So I'm, it's amazing. Um, I'm so humbled by that. You know, for a small little indie movie, man, uh, that uh, is not action packed and it's just a little character piece, uh, it's pretty overwhelming uh, that the response and everyone's been so wonderful and uh, excited about the project and everyone can't wait to see it and I can't wait to show it to you guys. Um, but if you didn't get a chance, also just go to thisismeg.com and you can also check out the new website that I've put together for the project so you guys can see how I'm marketing. The film and and also in the indie film syndicate, I'm going to be going over uh, all the marketing I'm doing for the film, uh, how I created the website, the mentality behind the website, the mentality behind the trailer, what we did, why we did it, and so on. But if you haven't had a chance to see the trailer yet, head over to thisismeg.com and check it out. And please spread, spread, spread the word. And also, guys, don't forget if you are in the LA area. You got to come out Saturday night to check out our stand-up comedy special fundraiser for This Is Meg. Uh, And it's going to be fun. We're going to have a bunch of the cast there. I'm going to be there. uh, And we're going to be showing the trailer there as well. And it's going to be a fun night. Uh, Everyone's going to laugh a lot. And hopefully we can raise some money for the uh, for the the festivals and some other stuff that we need to pay for uh, for This Is Meg. So... If you want tickets, uh, just call 626-577-1894, and that's at the Pasadena Ice House. And uh, we're going to have Joseph Reitman there, Sean Pulaski, of course, Meg herself, Joe Michelle Million, and Carlos Alizraki from Reno 911 fame. And we're all going to be doing, uh, not all, I'm not going to be doing, but they're going to be doing some amazing stand-up, uh, and uh, all proceeds uh, go to helping us get this movie out into the world it's gonna be a fun night so definitely check it out now today's guest uh i you know what man i i saw this movie poster (laughs) i saw this movie poster uh months ago at Cannes, and last year actually at Cannes, and the movie poster was for a movie called attack of the killer donuts and it looked awesome the poster was so well done 
the quality. I was just absolutely shocked at how good it kind of looked. And it looked so much, so much, it was like, it looked like it was so much fun. And, uh, and I felt that these guys were absolutely knew what they were doing when they put this whole thing out. And I wanted to bring, uh, bring on one of the filmmakers. His name is Rafael Diaz Wagner. And he's an accomplished filmmaker who's worked on multiple films over his course of his career. And he's a Miami boy. And we've walked a lot of the same, a uh, lot of the same. We were, as he says, we're, we've uh, fought in a lot of the same foxholes uh, from back in the day when I was in Miami. So uh, I wanted to have him on the show. I wanted to talk to him about how someone gets, first of all, gets financing for a movie called Attack of the Killer Donuts and his whole process of how he made it and how they're marketing it, how they're selling it. And uh, how you kind of put together a cult classic, you know, and it, and it, uh, how is it, how that works? So, without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Rafael Diaz Wagner. I'd like to welcome to the show Rafael Diaz Wagner, man. Thanks for coming on the show, brother. No problem. It's it's uh, we we uh, we've we've walked a lot of the same as I call gravel in Miami, haven't we? Yes, we have. We've been in the same uh, foxholes. Yes, we have. <laughs> <In> the trenches. <laughs> and you told me when we before we got on air that um, my uh, you used to run the Miami Underground Film Festival. Yes, I was the years. founder, and I ran the Miami Underground Film Festival for four years. And one of your films, Broken, mm-hmm. won a golden coconut. <laughs> oh, golden <laughs> coconut. To- that is yeah, awesome. we used to give out the golden coconuts. That's yeah. right, and it's been a decade. So um, forgive me if I forget. I just said no. I wow. was like, I remember. <laughs> no, I remember. No, I remember the the festival. I'm like, did I? I, had, I mean, I had to have gone through there. I'm like, was, I, I I hit every festival in Miami, especially mm-hmm. in Florida. So I'm sure. But that's so cool. I'm so glad I won the golden coconut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so man, let's let's talk a little bit about how you got into this crazy business. Why why, why do you do this and not get a real job? <laughs> well. That, that's what my wife wants to know. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> you and me both, brother. Yeah. I went to school uh, here in Miami, Florida International University, and they didn't have a film program. And, and I always loved film, but, you know, where son of immigrants, your parents are always pushing you to be you know, like an accountant or something steady. Yes. And I studied um, English, journalism, stuff like that, dropped out. A senior year to start my own magazine that lasted like six months. Then I did odd jobs for about 10 years. Uh, from working at a think tank in Washington, D.C. to selling used cars here in Miami. And then wow. finally, <laughs> I worked at – do you remember Lion Video in Miami? The, the No, I don't. Lion Video was the premier DVD store in Miami. It was, um, it was specialized in foreign films. And I worked there and it was like – that was my film school. I mean they had stuff on tape back then that still is not out on DVD today. I mean, like foreign. We had an entire wall of French films with no subtitles. It was just straight up French, <laughs> and that's where that's where I learned. You know, I always loved cinema, but that was like whoa, another level. You know, Fassbender and stuff like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then <clears throat> somehow I got back into it, and I shot a short. And then from there, I I did a feature film for twenty thousand dollars in two thousand four called Pork Chop and a Glass of Water. It's a fantastic and title, by the way. Fantastic title. <laughs> we we went to a few uh, to a few film festivals, but nothing really came of it. And then from there, just you know, struggling here and there, P- paing sometimes. Mm-hmm. And then I then I was a production coordinator on a film for National Lampoon called uh, The Legend of Awesomeness Maximus in mm-hmm. 2008. Mm-hmm. And then the the economy went down and did some odd jobs again. I mean, I've gone in and out of the business like two or three times. Mm-hmm. And then things really started kicking, I would say like around again in 2013. And I went uh, two years back to back filming. We started, uh, we ended 2012, 2013 filming a, a movie called Shark and Saw Women's Prison Massacre. Which I wanted to talk to a little bit. Can you please talk a little bit about Shark, uh, Shark is it Shark and Saw Women's Prison Massacre? Because I saw the trailer yes. today. Yes. Uh, it's quite genius. Can you please tell? <laughs> it's a great cast. I love. To, just tell us a little bit about that movie. That film, I um, I was looking on IMDb, and I want I could so I, I'm I'm good talking to people, and I th- I thought I could get a little bit of money to make a movie, mm-hmm. but unlike you, I didn't study directing. I can't edit, so I'm I'm limited. I'm a writer by mm-hmm. heart. I mm-hmm. can write till the cows come home, and producing comes naturally. You know, mm-hmm. it's the, the Miami Cuban in me. Mm-hmm. So I I needed someone who was turnkey, someone who had experience, and I looked and I found Jim Winorski. 
And if you don't know who Jim Wynorski is, he is Roger Corman's most prolific director. He's made over 80 films. Wow. And so I cold called him and he responded. And we talked back and forth and he's like, you know, yeah, I do low budget. I'm like, well, we could do this and blah, blah. So I got, you know, some monies and we decided to go to northern Florida, west of Tallahassee, an hour west Ooh, to shoot some caves. Ooh. Yes. So just for everybody who knows, west of Tallahassee is, <laughs> is I think you've left Florida at that point. Well, it was central time zone. I didn't even know that. I yeah, yeah. I was going to say, you are, <laughs> you've, you really left, uh, you've left Florida at that point. I, a lot of people argue that after Orlando, you've left Florida. <laughs> yeah. So we went there and then he brought along his crew as turnkey. We brought in uh, Tracy Lords. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew um, Dominic Swain's boyfriend mm-hmm. from LA. And then, you know, I was talking to him. I'm putting together this project, AFM. And he's like, oh, you should call Dominique. And, he, and I was like, come on, dude. She's not going to do this. I can't afford her. And he's like, oh, yeah, she loves stuff like this. So we called her, boom, and, and she was on board too. Mm-hmm. And uh, we went over there to make this this crazy little film. And I thought this is going to be a cakewalk. This guy Wynorski's made over 80 movies. I mean there's books on him. There's a documentary on him. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, we got there on the first day and it's like, oh, my god. He's a freaking maniac. <laughs> it really? was a nightmare. Really? It was – yes, it was a nightmare. I really thought I was going to get a heart attack. What happened? It was it was one of the worst experiences I ever had. Uh, day one, I walked off set, and when I come back, it's lunchtime, and he's throwing a sandwich and firing the caterer. Now, obviously, in LA, you can do that. It, west, you know, west of Tallahassee, in the middle of nowhere, you can't fire the caterer because there are none. There's yeah, so, there's not like fifty more caterers you can call. Yeah, he was just you know, I, I don't I don't want to talk bad about people, but I think. That sometimes bravado and maverick and, oh, he, he's a hustler, gets people away with certain behaviors. Yeah. Like I've heard, you know, her horror stories of Michael Bay. I don't know him personally, but yeah. but I don't think there's an excuse for that. I mean, you know, the, the, the makeup girl cried twice. I had to, you know, talk people off a ledge. We were, you know, going over production. It was just – it was a wow. maniac. Wow. You know, like what, how old was one – How old was he when you made that movie? He's in his seventies, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've I've had I've had I've, I've had experiences with, with, uh, and I'm not gonna say older directors, but directors that are, that have like have had um, you know success in their early days, and they're like in their seventies, sometimes even eighties. I've had projects, and uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, it's very crazy. interesting. So very interesting. So we, we got past that. And then um, I'm the producer on that, but then eventually we we had a, a difference of opinion with the executive producers and him and stuff like that. And I just I, I walked away from the project. Mm-hmm. And then they went on to post production and they they sold it and it's distributed by Shout Factory. So I saw it on in Best Buy and stuff. Nice, nice. And and as a matter of fact, if you go to IMDb, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm credited as the sole producer, but if you buy the DVD or rent it, m- my name is not in the credits. <laughs> So <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so. That's that's but that's the stuff they don't teach you in film school. Exactly. That. And then from that experience, which was really a low point where I, I really did think I was going to get a heart attack. It was that bad. I felt sick. I didn't want to go to sleep at night because I didn't want to wake up the next day. Right. And then from that, a year later, I went to probably the best experience I've ever had in a film. And that's Attack of the Killer Donuts. So let's talk about Attack of the Killer Donuts because that actually is the reason I called uh, and reached out to you. Uh, and then, and then once we started talking, we realized that you know we'd known each other, we we'd known each other's work, and we were from Miami and all that kind of stuff. But dude, I was as I was telling you all, when we were off air that I saw the poster mm-hmm. for Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. While it was at the Cannes Film Festival, donuts. Yeah, donuts. Oh, excuse me, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. See, sorry. Yeah, Florida, Floridian slip. Uh, yeah. Attack of the Killer uh, Donuts, and I saw this amazing poster, and I'm like, this can't be real. This can't be a real movie. And I looked it up. I'm like, holy crap! Someone made this movie. This is awesome. And I actually posted it all over the place and and retweeted it and everything. And everyone was like. This can't be real. Everyone's like saying, no, <laughs> this is a fake. Because it looks so good. The poster looks so good that it looked like a fake movie. It yeah. didn't look like a real movie. But then I saw the trailer. I'm like, this is brilliant. So that's why I reached out to you because I wanted to know, first of all, what brought you to make a cat Attack of the Killer Donuts? Well, well while filming uh, Shark and Saw, there was people involved there. And, you know, you're, when you're on set, you're always thinking, what's the next gig? Mm-hmm. And yeah. there were people that were floating around this idea. 
of oh you know what we have this idea for this movie and i was like ah, i love that and then um you know killer donuts and then i said well let's call it attack of the killer donuts because i'm gonna i'm gonna show you my my hand here and the reason it says attack is number one because it starts with an a of course yeah yeah oh yeah you know, distributors list yeah oh yeah let's yeah. i mean what when do you go you're you're in a hotel room on video on demand and you start at z never you start at a so boom, attack, and it, and it, and it has also attack of the killer tomatoes. It's like it just rolls off the tongue, you know, attack mm-hmm. stuff like that. So mm-hmm. we did that. I I read the script, and there was a lot of potential there, but the action didn't really start until like page forty five or fifty, it's and just, you just you can't do a movie like that. Like for people that you know who are just listening or who, who not don't know, every page in a script, every every page is a minute. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about nothing happening for 45 minutes. That's just, you, you can't do a movie like that. In a movie called Attack of the Killer Donuts. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. like, I mean, I love slow cinema, but this is not <laughs> slow cinema. So this, this is definitely not a French New Wave film. Exactly. <laughs> you're, or like, there's an Austrian film a few years ago, I remember called Revenge, which is like two and a half hours, and it's so slow, and I was like, I love it. But, you know, that, that's, <laughs> that's not this. Right. This is more the Roger Corman school, where... Yeah. What I like to say is every 10 to 15 minutes, either something's blowing up or someone's getting blown, but something has to happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't just sit around. So right. uh, we, we, we tried to do a rewrite and it was still kind of like, mm. and like I said, my strong suit is, is writing. Mm-hmm. So I bought the rights and then I rewrote it. And then that's where we are now, which is what, you know, we start off and it's in a, in a laboratory and this critter rat attacks the guy. So it's like, you know, because story wise, we couldn't get the donuts killing early because they have to be made, which was the problem with 45 minutes. So I had to come up with some sort of action to at least hook you. And what we did is it's uh, Uncle Luther. He's the... Um, the mad professor, and he's doing the reanimation serum. Mm-hmm. And then we see him test the rat, and the rat comes to life, and it attacks him. And at least it's like, okay, there's something here. It's, you know, it's kitschy, and then it gets the thing going. And then eventually he he drops it into the Fry Later 3000, and the donuts come to life. Right. That's so. ge- that's that's genius. Absolutely. And bad things happen. Yeah. And bad things. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, when, when there's killer ooze that, <laughs> that yeah. radiates donuts, generally bad things happen. Um, yeah. And now you also got to work with the legendary C. Thomas Howell. Yeah. Uh, how was how was C. Thomas to work with, man? That was also you know one of those things where you think we'll never get somebody like him, sure. but he, somebody knew somebody that knew him, and he reached out and he got it. You know, he, he's like, I know what this is about. It's not a Shakespeare, but it, it's something. You know, he's he's been in the business for a long time. Well, since E.T. <laughs> If not yeah. earlier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and he uh we negotiated, we got him down to a to a ridiculous price that I can't say because I mean he, he won't admit to it. He's like, that's a lie. <laughs> and so <laughs> so we had him for three to four days uh-huh. and he and he agreed and then you know he showed up and it was great. He was just like, All right, what are we doing? So <laughs> so know. so so that's a that's a really good point. You had him for about three or four days, right? Yeah. And so that's a thing that a lot of people that are listening don't understand that when you see some of these bigger names in these kind of lower budget indie movies, they're not there for three or four weeks. They're there for a day sometimes, sometimes two or three. And though, and then you just put their face on the, the DVD cover or on the poster to sell the movie. Is that generally the way it works? Exactly. Yes, that's exactly how it works. And then that's a big advantage because I always get asked, you know, I'm based in Miami, even mm-hmm. though I filmed donuts in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Oh, what's the, what's the advantage? What's better? Do I move to LA? And there's good and bad in both. The advantage to Los Angeles is, you know, it's easy for me to tell a C. Thomas Howe, I need you three days, just drive up to this address or send yep. the limo to get him. Yep. As opposed to we're shooting in Miami, I got to fly him. Yep. According to SAG, he can't act that day because he's flown. So mm-hmm. that's two days now. Then he acts. He can't fly out that day. So now it's three days. You know, it's just, it's a lot harder as opposed to just drive up, boom, boom, and you're done, you know? Right, exactly. And that's that's one of the things I've, when I moved from Miami and started doing projects here, being here, everyone's here as far as yeah. actors are concerned. So in this low budget kind of world, uh, it's a lot easier. I'm like, hey, can you come out for like four or five hours today? And uh, yeah, and, and just like, as opposed to when I was in Miami, forget it, like trying yeah. to get... Someone, you know, let's say a Danny Trejo to fly out, forget it. Yeah, but, you know, it's not going to happen. But if Danny's at home, he's like, yeah, I'm not doing anything on Thursday. Here's my rate. Yeah, I'll show up. And there you go. And and you've got and you've got a Danny Trejo in your movie. Um, now, you were we were talking off air a little bit about uh, pay of actors and, 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 and some people overpaying and underpaying. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yes, uh, the movie we shot in 2008, uh, National Lampoon's The Legend of Awesomeness Maximus, that was a $2.2 million budget. And that had some names in it. I mean, we had uh, Will Sasso, Ian Zuring, Rip Torn, Kristana Loken. I mean, there were there were names in there. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I tell people because I love giving advice. You know, people ask me, "Oh, what do you think this?" And I tell them, "You know, you're going to have to overpay somebody. Someone's going to get overpaid." Mm-hmm. But the flip side of that is that you're you're going to get some deals on somebody. I mean, I don't want to say you're going to screw somebody, but you know. It's it's the other side of the coin, and usually the first person to drop is the one you're going to have to overpay because nobody wants to be first. Right. I don't care, you know, unless you're like you know Woody Allen or something like that. If people draw, trip over themselves to be in your movie, nobody wants to be first. They're going to ask you who's directing, mm-hmm. who's in it, and nobody wants to be the first guy. So you're going to have to overpay somebody, you know. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you'd be surprised. Some of these older stars that have more clout in the European markets mm-hmm. are willing to do certain things, you know, for prices. Like I, I've heard, you know, like a Malcolm McDowell give you a day for 30,000. Oh yeah. You know? Oh yeah. I've heard of that too. Malcolm, you know, but, yeah. As yeah, long as but, the project, he's a little bit yeah. more picky, but yeah. But it's, if it's in LA, you know, it's, Hey, I'll send a limo 30,000 one day. I don't care how big you are. $30,000 in one day. That's, come on. You got to be at a certain place in your life to turn that down. Yeah. You got to be, I mean, as as a human being, you've got to be in a certain place in your life to turn down 30 grand in a day. Well, look at uh, Bruce Willis and that that fiasco with with Expendables 3 where he turned down a mill, not for a day, but he turned down a million bucks and him and Sly got into kind of like a, you know, a hissy fit about it. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. Well, w- it, Bruce is legendary now, apparently, yeah. for being <laughs> yeah. being an interesting character to work with. Though he'll always be John McClane to me, and that's who I'd like to think of him as. Yeah. Well, look, Harrison Ford was like, I'll take that million, dude. I'll be in that. <laughs> you know, it's Harrison Ford. So it just depends. Yeah, exactly. It's just – exactly. Exactly. And and But I've – I mean, since I've been in LA, I've worked on, God, I don't know, probably 40 features. Uh, and I've seen a lot of these guys. And I, I always ask the producers, like, how much did you pay for these guys? You know, I'm like – and I'm shocked. Shocked sometimes yeah. at, at how affordable they are in the grand scope of things. You know, 10 grand here for a day, 5 grand for a day, 3 grand for a day. You know, work, you know, oh, 10 grand for a week, you know, things like that. And you're like, really? Some of these people are, you know, household names, older, but household names. I was speaking to one actor, uh, I won't say his name, but I was asking him specifically, and he's, if I, I said his name, everybody would know who he is. But I was asking him, I was like uh, working on a set somewhere. And I'm like, you know, do you, why do you do a lot of these, you know, kind of lower end movies? He's like, dude, they're, I call those alimony movies. <laughs> I, you know, I've got I got alimony to pay for. I got mortgages to uh, mortgage to pay for. I got I got to pay my bills. So that's what they're called. You know, he goes, I do them. You know, that's why I do them. So, and then some guys just like to work, like Trejo. Tre- yeah, that, da- Danny just works. I want to I want to stre- yeah emphasize that too. We don't want to make it seem like they're just mercenaries or they're down no, on their no, luck. No. In the end, they want to act, yes. and these smaller projects are funner for them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you're working on shark, uh, shark, na- shark, and it, I can never say that word. Shark and saw. Shark and saw. Thank you. <laughs> shark and saw. Women's prison massacre. Yeah. You're generally you you feel that you might have a good time on that movie, you know, yeah. or Attack of the Killer Donuts. Probably going to be a fun set. Hopefully. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, it was. I had 30 year veterans tell me I haven't had this much fun in my life as a matter of fact i mean i don't want to give away any of the movie but there's a there's donuts and they're, yeah there's donuts there's a, and killers we, we had someone who made um don markell he made a an eight foot by eight foot mock-up of the donut shop and we blew it up and he was actually on the team that won the oscar for blowing up the white house in the first movie and why did he do my movie because he's retired and he's like sure i'll make a I like a few bucks and I'll have fun. And he had a blast. He would get into costume and scare the makeup girls. He would like animate a rat, remote controlled. He was just like this old school kid. guy. He having, yeah, he, he was, was a kid, and he fun. was loving it. He was loving it. And what people don't realize is California is the desert. And we were in Acton, California, which is like uh, thirty minutes north. Mm-hmm. And in December at night, it's cold, mm-hmm. <laughs> very cold. So he would dress up in this – he had some like Bigfoot suit. Mm-hmm. And we're in the woods shooting the Attack of the Killer Donuts and he jumps out. And even grown men like Grips were like, ah, Don, is that you? You know, stuff like that. So, But <laughs> it was great. I mean there's some scenes where we literally told everybody grab 10 donuts and when we say action, throw them. That was, you know. I mean seriously, that's just fun. That's just good. That's yeah. just good times. Mm-hmm. That, that's, it is. It really that, is. That's just good like, 
like I said, I went from the worst experience to the best experience. And that was, you know, Attack of the Killer Donuts. So let me ask you a question. How did you, because what caught my eyes, because there's, look, there's a lot of movies that are made at this budget level, at this kind of genre kind of stuff. But very few are actually marketed properly. And mm. you actually had an amazing poster that caught my eye because I saw the quality in it. And I'm going to put a link. I'm going to have a, a copy of the poster in the uh, in the show notes, guys, so you guys can take a look at the artwork on this. I'm assuming that you obviously with just the name, you were already thinking about marketing way before you ever shot anything. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we don't have the funds. Unfortunately, when it's low budget, I mean, you throw everything at at the film and then at post-production and we had real donuts puppet donuts and cgi donuts so we, we really put the monies on the screen and it doesn't leave you much for publicity and unfortunately it's part of the equation you know you have to you have to leave something for that so i always thought like i said attack starts with an a we can get out there and then we got our our foreign distributor and they they took it to, they it's been to the berlin film market cons film market and it's going to toronto in, in next week nice so. nice now how how has it been received and have you guys gone after the festival circuit have you been played in festivals well we, we, foreign went for the markets and then we had our world premiere july 1st at the florida supercom oh, and we, we nice. won best film so. as you should as you should yeah. i know the, i know the guys who run that that's uh they're great that you, is terry still running that uh yes yes he is and, and as a matter of fact um now next week we're going to the Rome International Film Festival uh -huh. in 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 Rome, Georgia. Because yeah. every time I say Rome, everybody's like, "Ooh, Ooh fancy!" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, something that I did is I, I'm very good at, at at strategy when it comes to festivals, and everybody worships at the altar of Sundance. And of I'll go on a limb and be the crazy guy. Mm -hmm. I don't care about Sundance. Mm -hmm. I don't like Sundance. I don't like what they represent. They mm -hmm. haven't been indie in over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And you're wasting your money because there's thousands and thousands of applicants and it's it's Hollywood. It's indie <laughs> Hollywood that's there. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I, I looked at a strategy of when is it going to be done? What, what, what months do we want to hit and target you know local ones, genre ones? Like I purposely wanted – to, for Florida Supercom to be our first one because it's home cooking, it's Miami, and mm -hmm. it's a it's it's a Comic Con, you mm -hmm. know. So uh, we were actually delayed for a year. We were supposed to go last year, mm -hmm. and we had trouble in post production and stuff like that. And it's funny because I look at my notepad, and I'm old fashioned. I'm I write everything down, and I had my festival strategy, and it's going exactly as I planned. All I had to do was change the dates. It's you know Florida Supercom, Rome International, if we can get in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we wanted to get into Fantastic Fest, sure, sure, but we didn't get in, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But that would have been a big one. And then, you know, now we're going to Melbourne, also in uh, in Melbourne, Florida. Yeah, I know. And That's a. By the way, anyone who's anyone who's listening to this, the Melbourne International Film Festival in Florida, Terry runs that festival. They are amazing, and they treat their filmmakers like gods. It's so much fun that festival. I can't wait. Yeah, it's Melbourne Independent. Film oh, excuse me, excuse, excuse me. I'm in the, in the Melbourne Independent. Yeah, because yeah, the other one's the one in Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So I got confused. Yeah, the Independent Film. They're awesome, man. Really great festival. Which and also again, it's little tricks and it, it, like the same way Attack starts with an A. When you look at the poster now in a few months, it's gonna say you know Florida Supercom best film, Rome International, Melbourne. Who know, how many people know Melbourne, Florida? Oh, dude, I was doing that. I was doing those tricks back in the day of Broken. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I got into Rome. I'm like, yeah, Rome, Melbourne. I, I use the Melbourne. It's Everyone's like, wow, you got into Australia? I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's mar it's marketing, man. It's marketing. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. you know, and back in the day when I went to when I went to Broken to Sundance, I literally just uh, I, I didn't get in. But I walked the streets with Broken, and I when I came back to my, on my website, I said I put the laurels up and I put Sundance, but then underneath it I put visiting. <laughs> That's good. And people were like, "Wow, it's Sun!" And I had people write up, "Yeah, straight from Sundance." I'm like, "Well, technically, I did come straight from Sundance." You know, so these are the kind of like guerrilla techniques you have to do sometimes in marketing. You have to. I mean, I think a lot of pro a lot of things. Uh, I'm sorry, a lot of people that go to like let's say a film school, mm -hmm. they teach you the right way, quote unquote, to do things. And mm -hmm. if you're gonna do that and play by Hollywood rules, you're gonna get squashed because Duh. you can't you can't compete with Transformers Three, man. You just can't. You yeah. know? Nope, you can't. And you can't and you can't compete with their marketing. Exactly. You, and you've got to be niche. You have to. The, as they say, the riches are in the niches. 
And it's very, very true. And, 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 and as long as you understand what your movie is about, like you obviously understand your market and demographic for Attack of the Killer Donuts. Like that is a very specific niche genre. It's a niche of a niche. So it's a niche of a genre movie. Uh, so it's a kind of that kind of movie, and and that's who you're selling it to, as opposed to people who make a ta- like a movie like a Cack of the Killer Donuts, and they're like, "Why didn't I get into Sundance?" I'm like, "Are you crazy? <laughs> like yeah. that? They don't program that, guys. Like like South by Southwest, it might have a shot. It might have a shot at, at like the midnight, you know, movie at, at South by Southwest or something like that. But well, speaking of that, we almost got into Tribeca. Believe it or no, not, no, that would have been but- awesome. I didn't apply though because I knew, like I said, but um, our foreign distributor had someone and they showed it to him and we almost made it to their midnight screening, but they were like, it's a little too small for us, you know, which is like, hey, I'll, I'll take it. You know, I understand. Yeah. But hey, that's shoot that you were in the conversations. Awesome. Yeah. Well, if not getting into Fantastic Fest hurt because it was like, yeah. man, this is up your alley. How do you not get what this is? You know, so, but hey. But festivals are like, but they, like, the festivals are festivals, man. And they all have, look, I'm going to go down that road right now with, with my new movie, This Is Meg. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, I've, it's the first time I'm going through it as a director of a feature film, not a producer of a feature or, or a director of shorts. So you can't take it personally, man. It's just like, look, it's the right place, right time, right project. And the right person sees it. And says, "Hey, yeah, let's let's make that happen." I've seen people get into Sundance that had absolutely no idea that would ever. There, it'd be, it was a lottery ticket, and then I've had other movies that were like, "Oh, that's a sure in for this festival," and they they don't get in. So yeah, something like Fantastic Fest. I mean, this, that's a no brainer. But who knows what was going on that day? The programmer who saw it, you know what I mean? It's it's just rough. I mean, to to their credit, I emailed because I'm. I'm caradura. <laughs> I don't know how you want to translate that, but <laughs> I'd be hard headed. That, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I, I, you know, thick skinned. Thick so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I, I emailed them and I'm like, hey, so what? Uh, is there any feedback? Because I want a feedback. You know, you yeah. can say no, but it's like, I got to know what's going on. And they're very nice and they, they you know, they wrote back. I mean, the, the letter stung even more because he's like, oh, our programmers uh, saw it and they just didn't have fun. They didn't get it. It's like, ow. <laughs> ow. Well, you wanted Ouch. it. There you go. <laughs> yeah, you wanted it. You know, but, but, then in Florida Supercom to actually see the movie because you know how that is. You make a movie, you're watching it for like a year by yourself to actually <laughs> see it with an audience. Oh, so much that fun. that justified it because it was exactly the right audience. I mean, they were yelling at the screen, they were telling the kids, "Don't get out of the car" and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. you know, and there's a lot of '80s references that I write off the top of my head. And yes, I'm taking a line from this movie. It's not like I'm oh, I'm trying to sneak it in there. No, it's an homage. And some people won't get it, but this crowd was like, oh my God, Ferris Bueller, you did it, and stuff like that. So they, they got all the inside jokes. Yeah, and this this is a kind of movie that, you know, in its initial release might not get what you want, or hopefully it will, but then five years down the line, all of a sudden you've got a cult classic on it because it has the potential for that without question. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I tell my investors, I don't know how much they <laughs> this reassures them, but it's like I know – 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we'll be making money in this movie. Are we going to make any money this year? I don't know. But 10 years from now, I know we'll be making money, and it's just – that's the way it is. you know. Yeah, ex- absolutely. Absolutely. Now, um, how is it – I want people to understand what it's like producing movies in Miami. <laughs> well, it, it's good and bad. Like, like uh, sometimes – and I'm – I fault myself here. Uh, I don't really like to play with others. So there's people that whenever I go to LA or New York or even you, you tell me, hey, do you know this guy? And it's like I have no idea who that is. And yeah. it's like, dude, he's been in the industry. It's like I do my own thing, you know, and mm-hmm. then I don't – you know, my Emmy isn't really like a film – No culture every every it's so hard to get a movie here that it's every man for himself you know uh and then i just put together my crew i usually go after money myself and Mm -hmm. i get people who are not in the industry because i like that because they're not going to read the script the one thing i mean i'm I'm a jolly kind of guy but i have a bad temper and the one thing that sets me off is when someone that doesn't know film says hey can i read the script it's like you, you, my producing partner like kicks me under the table. She's like, Oh my God, please don't blow up. And it's like, because it's like, I'm going to get Frank Geary to design this building. And then I'm going to ask him to read the blueprints. Do you know anything about blueprints? No. And what the hell are you doing? Have you read a script? No. Shut the fuck up then. You don't need to read the script, you know? <laughs> the- the bad side is that then they're, you know, especially in Miami, you know, Miami, what's the mm-hmm. only business here is tourism and construction. Construction is how much is the building? When is it going up? When do I get my money? Mm-hmm. And film is, 
it's tough. You don't know what to say. You know, you got to be – and the best thing is be honest with them. If you tell them, hey, yeah, right away you're going to get your money back, that's the wrong way to go because it's not going to happen. No. So, you know, paint a picture and in your contract be very specific. There's a line in the contract that says this is an investment and there's, you know, in legal speak, but mm -hmm. you could lose everything. And that's the truth, you know. Yeah, you have to. You have to do that. Uh, now, let me ask you a question. With um, these kind of genre movies, in your experience, how are they being accepted by distributors? Like I know there was a big run on horror and a big run on sci-fi. You know, are these kind of genre movies still being accepted and actually still – being needed in the in the in the in the marketplace i th i think there's fans for them mm -hmm. but the reason i did shargans on the first place was i saw what sci-fi was doing and buying and mm -hmm. i heard the numbers they were paying mm -hmm. and this is like three years ago mm -hmm. they were paying anywhere from from 250 350 to like half a mil or more mm -hmm. because they would give you incentives on ratings and that just doesn't exist anymore I mean, and not right now, going through that right now, where my my domestic sales guy is telling me, you know, people aren't buying, and what's happening is even Netflix, they're investing in in creating original content, which is good, but then we're back to having to pitch, and and that's what I want to avoid. So really, I'm go entering a phase where Attack of the Killer Donuts, I hate to say, my might be my last uh, horror comedy mm -hmm. and, because I'm really going to go even lower budget indie. And what I really like, like I said, is my world is more noir, more that kind of, you know, Reservoir Dogs, not even Pulp Fiction mm -hmm. or, or Fassbinder or that, that sort of – that's where I'm going to go. And it's very realistic. Uh, mm -hmm. I like as a director because I'm, I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. That's what I am. And then I'm a producer by nature and director by necessity. <laughs> and and I'm gonna direct and and what I like how I like to direct is very like voyeuristic camera. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't like camera moves. I don't like handheld. I want it to be almost like there's certain Robert Altman movies. If you see a, a chance uh, to see the company, oh, you yeah. see the see yeah. the whole movie and you don't realize, oh man, I just saw a movie. I, I don't like to be taken out of the experience. I want you to think you're seeing real life. Mm -hmm. So very minimalistic, not too much music. Music is great and it does it enhances a film, but it's still a film. Mm -hmm. When you see an, an indie low budget movie and there's no music, man, that's really happening. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So that that's what I'm gonna embrace and that's what I'm looking at. That and also uh, documentaries. I'm in post production on a documentary right now and I'm prepping for another one. They actually sell all the time and they sell and they travel really well from my understanding. Yes, big time. That's what's they're cheaper to make. Very and cheap. there's a there's a demand for them. You know, and I was lucky to to speak to Billy Corbin that uh he's the one who did Cocaine Cowboys and he won mm -hmm. an Emmy for the U. And he's a Miami guy. And again, I just how did you talk to Billy Corbin? I co called him. Yep. And he's, you know, he's the kind of guy that he'll answer the phone, you know, and his assistant said, you know, he only has half an hour at this day, this time. And I, and I was like, all right, I'll do it. And he ended up talking to me for over an hour and just, you know, picking his brain. And he was, I was telling him, I want to go into documentaries and what do you recommend and this and that. And he was like, yeah, man, they're, they're selling, you know, Netflix wants them. Everybody wants them. So it's the way to go. And it's for my type of shooting. Like I said, I don't, I wasn't trained as a director. I don't think, oh, let's move the camera here. And then yeah, you're, more and you're more documentary in general. I'm already more cinema verite. So I might as well just stick to that. So, yeah, that's, that's the thing. A lot of, a lot of people don't understand that, uh, that documentaries are doing really well and have been doing well for a long time. And you're, and I've seen, I've no, I know guys who've made over a million dollars self-distributing their documentaries uh because of the because of the the whole um the cause and, and finding a cause behind the documentary and then everyone jumps on board well, uh, sorry look at adam carolla adam carolla uh did a documentary on paul newman and then he's self-distributing not because nobody wanted a movie but he's taking the middleman out of it oh, he yeah. has a million followers on that podcast. Yep. He put he put it up on a thing called VHX. Yeah, uh, I know. Yeah, of course. I have my stuff on VHX as well. They're I excellent. love VHX. Mm -hmm. And it's he's selling directly. So he has a million followers. Mm -hmm. If ten percent of his people buy it, that's a hundred thousand. Yeah. Exactly. Times fourteen, that's one point four million dollars in his pocket. Not to a distributor. You know, you can't beat that. No, absolutely. And then on top of that, then you can go to Amazon Video Direct directly and start popping it up on there. You can do Vimeo Pro. I mean, there's so many revenue streams yeah. now for, but you need that audience. Is what I preach all the time. You need an audience. That's the key. And and then now the Range 15 guys. I don't know if you know about the. No, I don't. Those, oh, it's a Range 15. Is this movie made by it's ex special forces guys that they have a clothing line at two separate 
groups and they combined and they made this zombie movie. And they, they have a huge following because it's a loyal fan base. Mm-hmm. And then they went to Indiegogo and they asked for 350000 and they ended up getting a million ch- and change. Wow. So, yeah. So then – and what they did is you know, instead of, hey, we get to make money. No, they threw everything at the screen. So they got William Shatner, Sean Austin, David Keith. I think Danny Trejo might be in it. Of course. I'm not sure. I think, I think <laughs> by law, Danny has to be in every movie, I think. <laughs> yeah. So – and and they put and they put it in theaters. They used I don't remember. I'm sorry, which one they used, but they used um some way where where you, you have to yeah Tug. there you go. We yeah. have to pre-sell a certain amount of tickets, mm-hmm. and if you make it, they'll put it in the theaters. And then now they're self-distributing, and they're using a distributor also. Yeah, distributors are awesome. Another awesome. Yeah. I'm actually going to be doing a bunch of stuff with distributor in the future because uh, they're they're actually cool. They do they allow you to kill the middleman, and yep. you can go directly to. All the online platforms and VOD and cable VOD as well. Yeah, it's it's up to you. I mean, there are there are fees, and it's not their fees. It's you know, it's not distributor taking their their cut. They they have a very small fee. It's it's uh, very Amazon taking, It's yeah. So, but the thing is, like I said before, you have to as a filmmaker if you're going to make a movie, look into distributor beforehand and see how much money you're going to need to save for that and tuck that away. So that when your movie is made, you can do it as opposed to now, hey, I want to be a distributor. I can't afford it, you know, so. Right, exactly. And then it's also about just uh, just understanding marketing, understanding a distribution plan, understanding all that stuff yep. when you make your movie and and keeping that budget low enough that you can yep. make your money back. Definitely. I mean, I think the budgets are going to get lower and lower. Um, mm-hmm. Donuts was under 500000 We shot um, – Shark and Saw for under three hundred thousand, if you can believe that, mm-hmm. and and I think the budgets are going lower than that. I mean, oh, again, yeah. depending on what you get, you know, you throw money at me, I'll make a movie. It, it doesn't matter how much money. I just it, it you can't make the same movie for the same amount of money. You almost have to be like uh, like food, like deconstructed. It's like okay, we only have one hundred fifty thousand. Can we make a movie? Yes. Uh, there's not going to be any stars in it. And what do we have? What are our assets? Well, I got uh, three blank guns, uh, a bikini a house, model. A My house. friend has a Ferrari. You know, so you just start to what do we got? And that's what the movie is. Yeah, you go you go down the Robert Rodriguez way of and Mariachi way of doing things, which is like yep. what what do you have? Let's write a script around all your assets. Exactly. And that's the smartest way of going about it. That's what I did with Meg. <laughs> I literally just looked around. I'm like, all right, I have access to these, this, 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 and this. That's what we're making our movie about. And let's go. Um, now, let me ask you: uh, from your experience in distribution, what, uh, what, like, as far as foreign sales are concerned, are there, um, are there specific uh, countries that like genre movies more, less? You know, what do you, what can, can you tell us? Any stories from the distribution, a worldwide distribution experiences that you've had? Uh, unfortunately, everybody wants names now. Okay. So when you, if you make a no name, like no, not with anybody na- any names movie, even this genre, it's it's hard. Mm-hmm. Japan, Japan always likes monster movies. Germany loves anything American. They're very kind, and and ironically, of course, the two territories we've already sold is Germany and Japan. Mm-hmm. So, but they're both very big markets. Yeah, in the big picture, yeah. yeah. And then there's um, we're an English speaking movie, so England is always going to be big. But then the other ones. It's kind of tough. It depends how much like, – again, if it was a straight horror slasher movie, I think it would maybe have more legs if mm-hmm. it had a nudity. But this is horror comedy, so – you know, Which is always a tough sell in general. Yes, in it is very, very. It's, People are like, why are you doing that? And it's like, well, that's just what we're doing here. So uh, so that's where it, – it's a little slow coming and then it's almost like does domestic – you know, if you make it big and domestic, then does that turn into – foreign but believe it or not more and more the domestic market usa and foreign is it's it's splitting it's a road and they're not meeting and it's just totally different like there's movies that are bombing here and they're rocking in china and then it's like oh, well, yeah. what what's more important you know? well like warcraft warcraft was an absolute bomb here but it yeah. but overseas it it killed yeah and and not only genre movies but sometimes you know the 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 more the more dramas Stuff like that, that, that it's, that's a nightmare to sell here, but they're into that in foreign. And something that I like, and it comes from my Lion video days, is I love foreign movies, so I get to – I know these actors. So it's like, oh, I recognize this guy. I recognize that guy. And if you have an opportunity, again, it, it all depends on cost. But the, this one guy, let's say you're doing a movie and it's the chef. Mm-hmm. Instead of just putting a no-name chef, if you can get this guy 
who's in Germany, but he hasn't made an American movie. Now when you go sell it, hey, Germany might be a little bit more interested. And they could give you a lot because he's a big German star. Exactly. Or this person who's – and again, remember, everybody wants to play here. Like in Miami, the big thing is there's telenovela stars left and right that want to break into the market. You know, again, unfortunately, Latin America is not so big as in Europe and other countries, but it's still, hey, it's still money. now exactly. And I got, hey, I got so and so in this. You know, and a lot of these telenovela stars are like me and you. They were born here, so they have zero accent. So yeah, you know, I was, I was, fact, I did a movie with uh, Kate del Castillo uh-huh. and Eva Longoria, and and they sold it in South America, huge because Kate. Kate de la Castillo, before the whole El Chape thing. Yeah, El Chape. Uh, no one knew her really as much here in the States, but she is, she, God, she's a monster over in, in, in South America. Yeah, and, and even here in some, here in the States domestically for, for some markets, like I, there's, a, there's a story of, I don't know if you know who Carlos Ponce is. Of, I know Carlos, yeah. If yeah I actually, worked, like, I've never worked with him, but I've met him a couple of times. He's awesome. <laughs> Nicest guy in the world. He yeah. was in for for people who are out there. He was in Couples Retreat. He's yes. the, the shredded guy in the speedos with yep. the accent. <laughs> he was also on uh, that uh, Cristela TV show. Yes. He started in that as well. Yeah, he's That's a super right. sweet guy. Super sweet guy. And he says a story once that, uh, that he he went with. I don't remember what big time actor. They were in L.A. and they're having lunch or whatever. And somehow they went to a restaurant. And who works in the back of the restaurant? You know, somebody took a peek and they're like, oh, my God, Carlos Ponce. And right. the entire kitchen comes out <laughs> and they're like, can we take a picture? Can we? And the guy, the actor he's with, thinks it's with him. And that guy hands him the camera and he's like, no, no, with Carlos. <laughs> and then, That's brilliant. So, so they take a picture and then they go back. And they, and I forgot who the name of the actor is. He's He tells Carlos, hey, dude, who the hell are you? <laughs> he's like, hey, man, I'm big. <laughs> I'm, I'm huge, just not yeah. right here, but huge. I'm big in the kitchen. <laughs> Yeah, Carlos is uh, Cuba, he's Cubano también, right? He's uh, Cuban parents born in Puerto Rico. Oh, okay, Cuban so, parents born in Puerto Rico. So, and he's he's excellent at accents in Spanish or English. Like mm-hmm. in Spanish, man, he'll go from neutral to Cuban to Mexican to Argentinian to it's like boom, boom, boom. But he's really good. He works all the time too. He's one of those yeah. guys that works all all the time. And he was born with ridiculously good looks, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> like absurd, absurdly good looks for for a man. It's ridiculous. Um, so let me ask you one: uh, like, if you had one, th- if you had a, a a classroom of fresh-eyed, wondered, like sparkly eyes, I want to be in Hollywood kind of film students. What would you say to them before they got launched into a film career? Right now, what I would tell them is shoot, shoot, shoot. Always be shooting. If you wait for this script is too good, I can't do it now, you blink and 10 years pass by and you haven't done anything. Mm-hmm. You know, I just, uh, this last weekend, uh, Jonas Trueva was in town and he spoke. He's a director and his father is Fernando Trueva, who won the Oscar for Best Foreign Film for Belle Epoque. And he's like in his 20s and he's making movies. Now he's made four movies. And this is a man who has a name in Europe. I mean he he can get people to give him money. And one of the movies he did took him seven months because he was trying to get funding and he got tired of that. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to get together with a group of people, my, my core keys, which is six people, and we're going to shoot for free. And we're going to shoot one day for six hours. And I don't know when we'll shoot again, but this day we'll shoot for six hours. And he did that for seven months, 22 shooting days, and he got a movie. Now, if I tell you, let's make a movie in seven months, that's a nightmare. Oh, my but, God. You know, Can you imagine? It's just – you just have to – what's the 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 uh, endurance that yeah. you have to just keep that momentum going? Oh, But the flip side is it's September now, and what have I shot this year? Nothing. If I would have done the same thing starting in January and said, I'm going to one day a week, just one day a week, we're going to shoot something for free. What would I have by now? You know, and to students who don't have money, who don't have the, you know, if you're a student still in school, you have an arsenal of equipment at your disposal. I mean, University of Miami has, you know, some of the movies I've shot. That's how, that's how I shot it because my DP worked for UM. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if you're young and you have that, you know, Shoot, always be shooting and don't be afraid to shoot something that's not as good. That's what being in your 20s and being in film school is all about. Mm-hmm. You know, experiment now. That's the problem with film, I think, in general. That you know, Picasso didn't wake up when he was 12 and said, Hey, cubism. No, he was classically trained and it took him years to get to that. As filmmakers, we don't get an opportunity to experiment and to grow because everything has to be a hit and it's too much money and that's too bad. You know, 
I think we need that. And that's what, and that's the thing that uh, I actually mentioned before is on the show as well is that I use the analogy of baseball, where everyone, anytime you walk up to the plate, filmmakers think they have to hit a home run, but but they only go up to the plate once every two or three years. But those guys that go up all the time, and you know what, they might be singles. But every single gets you closer to that home run, and you just got to get up to the plate. And by getting up to the plate, you just got to keep shooting, got to keep making. And don't worry. If it doesn't turn out great, all right, you learn and you move on. And that's something that – it takes years. And, you know, you and I are both from the same vintage. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think that's something you learn with age. You know, we – you know, I, I'm in my 20s, I couldn't, have, I couldn't even fathom that. But it's something that as you get older, you're just like, you know what? What's the worst that will happen? You make a movie that you doesn't doesn't do everything you want it to do, but it's okay. You've you made a mistake. Every one of these, every one of these big directors all made mistakes. Every one of them. And they learn from it, them. And it's getting to you, it's getting you to where you want to go. It's getting you to that point. Look at Mark Duplass. He said it. Oh, he's like, you man. know, he he he's the he should be the inspiration for everybody out there yep. and that, that speech he said at south by southwest two years ago where he said the calvary is not coming those days of you're going to sundance they're going to write you check for three million dollars are not going to happen nope. and he knew that so what he was is instead of being good i'm going to be prolific <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. and he went him and uh swanberg yeah so swansburg lynn shelton that whole crew right that mumblecore group they were cranking out you know three four sometimes swanberg did five movies in one year one year he did seven that was his record wow. <laughs> he's you know? a crazy man but it's feature films again. You know, I'm sometimes I'm a little harsh. Some people do shorts. Yeah. But it's because a feature film is something you could sell. It's real. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not saying I'm not knocking shorts. If you do a short, that's great. You know, you're still shooting. Mm-hmm. But you do a Swanberg or a Dupless and you crank that for five years. Let's say four movies for five years. Hey, after five years, you got 20 feature films under your belt. Someone's, someone's going someone's someone's gonna to take notice. Yeah. No, that's the thing. And that's what Swansburg said. Like it took him, uh, I think, probably about four or five features. Shooting on VHS, like, you know, on our mini DVs and stuff like yeah. that. They didn't care about sound. They didn't care. That whole mumblecore movement is kind of the inspiration for what I did with Meg, uh, but at a, hopefully at a higher production quality uh, than they did when they first started, <laughs> than the, when they first started out. Yeah. Um, but the technology now, you could just go out and shoot, man. You just, yeah. go, out, just go out and shoot. It's, it's crazy, man. It really is crazy. But that's great advice. I'll go now. Well, and as a matter of fact, there's 10 to 20 film festivals around the world specifically specifically only for stuff you shoot with an iphone or with uh with your phone so that's just, you know oh i don't have a camera i don't have money you got a phone they sell lenses a lens little mini lens package for phones for like 40 bucks so there's yep. no excuse you know no it's not gonna be pretty but it's something well i mean look at tangerine and i use tangerine uh, all the time with sean baker did who won sundance shot on that iphone but a lot of people thought that like, oh, now I can go shoot a movie with an iPhone. I'm like, well, if you want it to look like Tangerine, you really got to do your homework and understand what he did. But you can do it. He yeah. did it. You can do it if, as long as it works for the story that you're trying to tell. If you're trying to make Transformers, the iPhone might be rough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but if you're making a character piece, it's fine. It's great. It's absolutely great. So, my friend, uh, I asked uh, the same questions of all of my guests. I have last two questions. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Um, to just do it. Like I said, uh, I've spoken to, to agents in CAA. I've spoken to Billy Corbin. I've spoken to, to other people. And I just picked up the phone and cold called. Mm-hmm. The worst that can happen is no. And also just to be persistent. My favorite word is relentless. I mm-hmm. won't stop. One investor that invested in one of my films – I would email him in the morning and call him at night every day for nine days straight, including Sunday. And one day he's like, we have to meet. You're driving me crazy. And I'm like, good. Because if you don't say no, I'm coming after you. I'm- oh, no. So, if he, if, so if, he would, if, he, if he would have said no, you would have stopped. If he says no, yes, I would have stopped. Unless I feel like maybe there's. Just a little bit more, but yeah, you got to say a hard no. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes no really means maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, what are uh, three of your favorite films of all time? Oh, this is such a difficult question because there's so many good fun. ones. I know, but three that, that tickle your fancy today, sir. I, there's there's something you just have to mention. I mean, my all time favorite is Casablanca. I love because man. you love see it now and yeah, there's midgets in the background and it's a miniature and yeah, yeah, they yeah, did yeah, so yeah. much with so little. Think about it. There's no sex in it. I nope. mean, it took me years to figure out, oh, Rick 
did sleep with her, but I didn't, you know, <laughs> it's so subtle. I didn't know that, mm-hmm. but it's just, it's such a great movie. And it's, I don't know if we have those kind of decisions or that kind of like love and a cause now, is there a cause you would really do that for? Hell no. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Casablanca, definitely number one, um, more modern Godfather. I of mean, course. that's just of course. perfect it's a movie, you know? It's a masterpiece, yeah. yeah. And then God, I got to go eclectic because I love like, like foreign films and stuff like that. So I think, I almost got to go Breathless by Jean-Luc oh, Godard. Oh, it's a great film, man. And and the thing is, it's very, it's a flawed film and it's not perfect. No. And people see it now, sometimes younger people, and they're like, I don't get it. I'm like, you know what? Go watch another French movie from 1959 or like Pillow Talk mm-hmm. from 1959 where mm-hmm. it's like they're in separate beds and it's mm-hmm. just this mm-hmm. polished turd where Breathless is so real. And, and it's long. like if yeah. you watch that movie and it doesn't inspire you to go out and shoot something – you're not a filmmaker. Now, so I, that, <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, and I'll tell you, and I'm, uh, to make a point to that. Um, and again, since you and I are both of the same vintage, and I wanted to ask you this: this has happened to me, where when you see something when you're in your teens or twenties, and you don't get it, but in your thirties you might start feeling a little bit. But maybe in your forties, I'm, I'm not saying you're in your forties, but um, but I'm 42. <laughs> okay, same. So you're the exact same vintage as I am. Um, so now you're in your early 40s and you watch a movie like Eyes Wide Shut, where when it came out in 99, you might have gone, hmm, don't, don't, under- I, I get it, but I don't get it. Or you watch Clockwork Orange or you watch, I'm just using Stanley Kubrick references, but, but <laughs> you know, those kind of movies that, you know, that age well and they age like, in other words, like great art should change as you grow. So looking at the Mona Lisa, when you're 15 should be a lot different than when you would look at it when you're in your fifties, you, the different appreciation, different kind of, you know, connoisseur of, of the, of the art. Yeah, it, 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 have you had also, movies like that? Yeah. And also taking, like I said, things into, in, in, in context, like for example, there's some younger guys now that see Pulp Fiction. They're like, eh, yeah, it's all right. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's all right because it's been so redone afterwards. Like but, the Godfather, like the Godfather. Put, yeah. Put it in 1994 and oh. you're like, wow, like breath. 1959 you're like whoa you know i mean certain things like uh coming home uh how hardly in 19 i don't remember if it was 69 70 around mm-hmm. there i mean let's let's put this into perspective there's a scene where um god what's angelina jolie's dad's name I just, john right voight john, john voight yeah. Yeah, yeah uh john voight is eating out jane fonda I mean, let me repeat that. He's having – he's performing hey. oral sex on Jane Fonda. This yes. is an R-rated movie in the cinema nominated for Best Picture. Mm-hmm. I think he won Best Actor for that. Now fast forward to 2016. You can't put a freaking boob on TV. I mean on, in the movies. Like I mean what is – yeah. how, how is that possible that we've regressed so much? You know, But uh, definitely, definitely what you said. Some movies age better. Like back in 94, again, Pulp Fiction, Forrest Gump. I mean I was in the Pulp Fiction camp all the way. Mm-hmm. Now, you ask me which is the best one, and you know what? Uh, it might be Shawshank Redemption. It might be oh, that it's, third no, it's, movie it's, nobody it's, talks about. Oh no, it is Shawshank. It's, it's, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, well, let's not talk about if Pulp Fiction is better than F- Forrest or better than than Shawshank. But Shawshank is one of those movies that holds and will hold for eternity. While I think Pulp Fiction, you're right, it was of that moment, and it was a it was a nuclear bomb that went off. While Shawshank was not that nuclear bomb, he was the tortoise. Yeah. And that tortoise has been slowly to now on IMDb, it's ranked higher than Godfather as the best movie of all time. Wow. And and a lot of people a lot of people put it up there with the freaking Godfather. Because it is. It's one of those movies that you just watch and just go, okay, this is as perfect of a movie as you can get, from my opinion. Uh, you know, and yeah. I think I'm not I'm not alone I'm not alone on that. Uh but yeah, that definitely that definitely happens. Uh, and uh I, like um from our time, you know, I thought Bloodsport was the greatest movie of all time when I saw it. <laughs> Now, don't get me wrong. Bloodsport <laughs> freaking rocks, man. <laughs> it's still that's, it's who that's the flip side of it. Like I, I love Bloodsport, but there, how many movies are there that you remember as a kid and it's like this movie's awesome, and you see it now and it's heartbreaking. It's like oh my god, it's so bad. This oh, movie's yeah, so like, bad. I mean, yeah, no, watch, well, I mean, Hard to Kill. I'm gonna go down the Steven Seagal, John Claude Van Damme camp. <laughs> All of those movies when they came out, I was just like. This is double impact. This is awesome. This is great. And then you like, oh, like I remember when that you watch it like it's on TNT or something as you're, you know, watching one night. And you're like, ouch. 
that doesn't hold. That <laughs> doesn't hold well. Two that two that pop up is Flash Gordon. You remember the Flash oh god, Gordon? Jesus man, Flash Gordon. That 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 that, <laughs> ate, that did not age well at all. And crawl. Oh my god. Oh my god, crawl. <laughs> like I still only remember it being the most awesome movie of all time when I saw. <laughs> Don't, I don't will, watch it. <laughs> I'm never going to watch it. And Liam Neeson was in that. Was he? Liam Neeson, a young Liam Neeson, was one of the like sub sub characters. Like he's one of like the co stars of that wow. movie. If you go back, but yeah, Crawl. For anyone who does, I'm going to put links of the description to these films <laughs> in in the show notes, guys, because Crawl arguably was the greatest movie of all time when it came out. Yeah. <laughs> like it was just like absolutely amazing. I remember Actually, I, uh-huh. speaking. Sorry, speaking of Liam Neeson, I have the Miami Vice episode he was in. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> anyone, like, if you guys watch Miami Vice, anyone listening, everybody who's a big star walked through the Miami Vice doors for those three. I'm like everybody: Bruce Willis, uh, Helen and Bonham Carter, uh, Liam Neeson, and then there's thousands of the names that I just don't remember off the top of my head. But Phil all Collins, the, Phil, well, obviously Phil Collins. <laughs> um, there was a movie, I'm, and I'm going to geek out for a second. Do you remember watching a movie called Showdown in Little Tokyo? Oof! That no, wait, don't tell me that is Duff Lundgren. Yep, and uh, Bruce Lee's Brandon Lee, the Bruce late, Lee's son. the late Brandon Lee. Yes, yeah, greatest action movie I had ever seen at that point. I literally oh. remember watching it, stopped it at the end of the VHS, rewound it, watched it again. It was just like such a great film, and I've seen it lately. And you know, it just it's campy now. Now it's just like, oh, that's kind of nostalgia campy. It holds better, surprisingly, than a lot of '80s action movies. Well, I mean, if if we're gonna geek out, let, I'm gonna go in the martial arts route. Oh, let's go, when, Jim Cotta. Comes, Jim Cotta. No, no, no that, that one's bad. <laughs> no, a uh, showdown in Little Tokyo. What I'm saying is, if you really want to see authentic Jeet Kune Do, which mm-hmm. is the, the form sure, that sure. Bruce Lee developed. Showdown Little Tokyo is probably – I don't know if, if they've done something after that, but that was the best example of Jeet Kune Do because what Brandon Lee is doing mm-hmm. is Jeet Kune Do. And if you don't know martial arts, it's gonna, it's very subtle. It doesn't go over your head. But it's a lot of like front lead, a lot of like – the name of Jeet Kune Do means the way of the intercepting fist. Mm-hmm. So the whole concept was not tra- the traditional kung fu mask, which is like whoa, whoa, and a lot of moves. It was just more direct. But if, you know, if you're a martial arts enthusiast and you want to see real Jeet Kune Do, that's – that's where it you know, peaked do, right there. Did he do it in rapid fire as well? He, well, he did, yeah. Anything that has Brandon Lee, he, he did that. Because that was he had, his. He, had like a, he only hit, unfortunately, only had a few movies. Yeah. Um, and The Crow, of course. Whoever's not seen The Crow, the original. I know they're talking about remaking it, but they shouldn't. The, uh, the first one. Really <laughs> why? Why do they make remakes? I mean, don't get me, crazy. Don't get me, don't get me started. I mean, MacGyver, the new show. Come on. Lethal Weapon, a show. Really? I don't get that. Come on. I don't get that. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Sorry, guys. Uh, we have gone off the rails. We've uh, <laughs> just started to geek out a yeah. bit. <laughs> well, before we go, like yeah. a, another movie I have to recommend, um, P.T. Anderson. Mm-hmm. Of course. People love him. I mean, Paul Thomas Anderson, he, he has a lot of great movies. Go see Hard Eight, his first movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's my favorite movie of his. I own it, and I'll pop it in. I've seen that movie like 12 times because it's so subtle. And it's so – how to make a good small movie. Yes, mm-hmm. Gwyneth Paltrow's in it and they have some names in it and, and uh, Samuel Jackson, whatever. But but look at the filming. Look at the shots. And a lot of times another advice that I give out, when I really want to see shots in a movie, I'll watch a movie in mute. Yep. Because then, then you know, you're not following the story. It's just visually. Like I saw with, with my wife, I went to the movies to see um, – what is this movie? Uh, Scott. Uh, the movie with uh with Michael Fassbender that he's an attorney. Um, not the not the, P- the Penelope Cruz, the counselor. Oh, the counselor. Do you remember the counselor? Mm-hmm. I that movie. That was a Ridley Scott movie, wasn't it? Yes, Ridley yeah. Scott. It, it was such a mess. My wife leaned into me and said, "Do you understand what's going on?" And I whispered and I said, "No, but look how pretty it is." It was like, <laughs> and I because it's Ridley. Her, it's Ridley. Yeah. yeah. When this comes out on DVD. I'm so gonna watch this in mute and really enjoy it because it was just the script was just a mess. I'm like, what is going on? I don't get it. But there's a scene when he sees the Mexican lawyer. It's a Rembrandt. I mean, what he does with lighting is fantastic. No, I mean, but really, Scott. I mean, he's yeah. he's a living legend, and I hope he continues to make. There's a few directors that I hope that can that are with us, like Clint Eastwood. I hope he's with us for a while longer. Because every time he does something, it's just, you know, for the most part, he always does amazing stuff. Ridley is one of those guys. Spielberg, of course. Though I heard BFG was a little 
off. I, I I hate to say it. we were on such a good note. I don't want to be a hater, but I, I've never been a real Spielberg fan. All right, uh, so that'll be the end of the episode, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Joke. No, no, happy. No, it, it, it's, okay. it's all good. He's a great filmmaker because what he does good is when he wants you to cry, you're going to cry. When he wants you to jump, you're going to jump. He is a good filmmaker. I just don't like his his style. That's yeah. that's all it is. Like for example, like what I was saying, like when I film, I don't want you to know I'm there and move my camera around. He. he he always has to have a little something where he lets you know, hey, I'm here. Like, for example, uh, this is a big pet peeve of mine. Uh, Catch Me If You Can. Mm-hmm. Great movie, Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The big climactic scene. He's packing the money in the second yeah, store yeah. and he, yeah. they're going to run out. And that money floats away where you know you had to do that with CGI because money doesn't do that. And it's like, why did you do that? Why are you taking me away from the film? Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. But in but his that's defense. that's style. But that's style. No, yeah. I mean, that's, again, that's that's just taste. You know, sure. in his defense, if you see Munich, which is a dark film, it's yeah. very, not like Steven Spielberg. It's just shot incredibly. That's that's an incredible movie too. And it's really dark. Yeah, yeah. And Jaws, of course, is still. Yeah. Jaws, again, it's the perfect uh, you know, you're not going to see the monster and you're still going to be very scared and you're going to jump when I tell you to jump. He, he He's great at that. Credit where credit is due. You and, know? J- and Joss holds. I mean, for movies, there's not oh, a lot yeah. of movies from the 70s that hold today. Well, it depends. I mean, there's a lot of like the 70s was the golden age of like this. is You're talking late 70s when we. Yeah, when yeah. Taxi driver. Yeah. Taxi driver. Yeah. Easy rider. Those things. But like just like the effect, like like Pulp Fiction was a very specific movie in the 90s that kind of blew up. And there's like Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver still holds very, yeah. very well. These are masterpieces. Uh, obviously, all of the Godfathers uh, in the 70s. Uh, but Jaws as a horror movie, like how many. How many thriller horror movies from the seventies hold today? You know, it's a very not short, not many. very not, very not short. Slasher, but yeah, they're not that good. Yeah, this you know something that just would still like if I pop that in, it'll still scare the hell out of you, and it's just done so well, so 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 well. But anyway, we have gone completely off the rails. Um, <laughs> no worries. Man. So, uh, Ravi, where uh, where can people find you online? Well, uh, Twitter and Instagram, it's Rafa Miami, R A F A M I A M I. Mm-hmm. Rafa Miami, and then uh, that's pretty much what I put out there. It's uh, I try to keep it either very positive, filmic. I don't get into politics or anything like that. So, or just everyday life. Like there's a an Instagram, a can of hoopinha that I'm drinking, or stuff like that. <laughs> and then uh, Attack of the Killer Donuts. We're do, we're gonna conclude our festival run and hopefully be available at, by the end of the year, if not December, January around that time, and probably at one point on VHX because I just I love VHX. I can't talk enough about them. No, VHX is a great pl- – again, if you have that – it's it's a great platform if you have an audience and if you can yep. drive traffic. If you could drive traffic, it's – I mean I would – if I can send a million people to VHX, I would self-distribute everything. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's not, just- even, not even a million. And that's another thing like, before we go, like a good point to put out there of you got to build your audience. And really in this day and age, what you need is 10,000 true fans. There's, there's a business term that, for that. That's actually 1,000 true fans. Oh, there you go. It's, 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 the, 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 it's based on the the um the article from uh the founder of Wired magazine. It's a thousand true fans. A thousand true fans. I could pay you ten bucks a month. hundred. A hundred. A hundred well, yeah. bucks a year. A hundred bucks. Yeah, a hundred bucks a year. Whether it's one one thing for a hundred or ten for ten, because then it's a hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. I say ten thousand because then you start flirting with that, you know, ten percent million. Yeah. 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 Right, so yeah. right. But yeah, yeah, you you gotta get you gotta get them out there because I. There's there's models that have millions of followers on Instagram, and I used one of them for a project, and I'm like, well, 10% of her followers, and it's like that doesn't translate. <laughs> you have to have true fans. No right. true fans are. Exactly. Just because you're you know a beautiful girl on Instagram and you have 3 million followers. Like I was talking to somebody the other day about it. Like if you put Kim Kardashian in a movie, that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it doesn't. She has 77 million followers on Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. Doesn't mean a thing. You know, it doesn't. It really doesn't mean a thing. So it's all. It's about true fans, people who really, uh, really care about what you're doing as an artist uh, or as a company, depending. So, my friend, I won't take up any more of your time, brother. Thank you so much for uh, for being on the hustle, man. Thanks so much. No, no, thank you, and and I look forward to seeing you in LA in person. I'll probably be there for AFM in November. So, all right, sounds good, brother. We'll see you soon. Cool. Bye bye. Man, Attack of the Killer Donuts. That's all I have to say. And you guys got to go check it out. Make sure you check out the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 108. Uh, I know you have links to all of his movies. I think we talked about on the show and so on. So definitely check it out and check out Raphael's other work as well. But 
Attack of the Killer Donuts, man. Seriously. You just got to love it, man. Got to love it. I love doing what I do here at Any Film Hustle because you get to meet so many amazing people from different walks of life with different creative visions uh, and, and getting their art out there, man, however they want to do it. So it's pretty it's pretty crazy. So don't forget to head over to filmmakingpodcast.com and leave me a good review for the show, guys, please. It really does help us out a lot getting the word out on what we do at the Indie Film Hustle and getting the hustle out to as many filmmakers as humanly possible. It is my goal in life to help you, the filmmaker, you, the artist, to get your work, get your your art out there, man. And as I have always said, it is your responsibility to get your art out there because you have no idea how it can change someone's life. Keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.